to entertain you first and foremost. And then I'd like to teach you a little bit about the Air Force Pilot Position Program. And lastly, I'd like to inspire at least one of you to go out and try something that you didn't think you could do uh, for whatever reason. And, and so with that, uh, let me share my story with you. You know, in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, you know, I quit my career as a doctor to join the Air Force. And my intention was to serve as a pilot. You know, I was 29 years old. Uh, I had a wife and a newborn child. And I applied by omitting the fact that I was, that I had six years of medical education and that I was a licensed physician because I needed to ensure that I went straight to pilot training. I needed to make sure I was in before I turned 30, which was the cutoff at that time for all pilots. And there was a lot of risk associated with that. You know, uh, part of my decision, a large part of my decision was driven by a sense of patriotism, idealism, but also a huge amount of ignorance of what the risks were for the choices I was making. And uh, my financial planner can tell you uh, what a, uh, from a financial perspective, not the smartest decision one can make. Uh, but nonetheless, I joined the Air Force and I'd heard about this program called the Pilot Position Program. Uh, however, no one in the Air Force who was a pilot position had ever come off the street as a doctor and went straight to pilot training. And, and so there was a lot of unknowns and hurdles that I was going to have to deal with along the road. But there's a quote from Kung Fu Panda that I always liked. Uh, for those of you who are parents, you might recognize, you know, if you only do what you can do, you will never be more than you are now. And so with that, let me give you a little bit of a background about what the pilot position program is and, and what's the point. Uh, obviously, it's about pilots who are also qualified as flight surgeons. And since the dawn of aviation, ever since airplanes started to start flying higher, faster, we recognized that the human body wasn't conditioned to operate well in this uh, environment. And so we started having doctors analyzing and learning what was going on with the human physiology and guiding us to mitigate some of these risks. And, and, and I'm talking about over 100 years ago. And in modern times, we've formalized that specialty of medicine into what's called aerospace medicine. And uh, we call these doctors flight surgeons. They don't actually do surgery. It's just a nomenclature that we use in the government. But the idea is flight surgeons are going to study the theory and understand the physiology of how the aviation environment affects pilots and make sure that all pilots meet the qualifications and medical standards to be able to fly and also understand the side effects of the treatments and how that could affect the mission and safety. And they're also trained to make sure that they know how to respond when there is an in-flight emergency, so from the ground guiding crews in the air. But there's a limit to how much you can really do by just observing. Uh, I would ask any one of you, you know, think about your careers and, you know, someone can watch you, you do what you do, but could they actually do what you're doing until they're in the hot seat and responsible for all of the decisions that you make? And, and that's the gap that I'm talking about with the pilot position program. Flight surgeons, they fly along with pilots if there's an extra seat on the aircraft because they need to understand what the environment pilots are in. But pilot physicians are unique in that they understand the theory, they understand all of the physiology, and they understand the regulations of the medical community as far as who can fly and then what grounding restrictions there might be. But they also understand how to operate their systems. They know what the mission requirements are. And when you put that together, that's a unique capability uh, that uh, has, has been very uh, important in the development of military aircraft. And so let me get into, you know, why does the Air Force even have pilot positions? Uh, you know, in the 12 and a half years that I was in the Air Force, there was only about anywhere between eight to 11 out of 330,000 people that were actually flying as qualified doctors. And, you know, you might think, you know, what's the point? Is it so that you can get uh, cool pictures and articles written about you and maybe have some uh, bragging rights at the bar? Well, probably a little bit, but the real reason for having the pilot position program is for that F-16 pilot that lost consciousness when he pulled a high G turn while he was still a student and had the auto G cast, the auto ground control avoidance system recognize that the pilot was no longer responsive in the cockpit. And instead of letting the jet crash 
into the desert in Arizona, recovered the aircraft to level flight, and saved his life. Air Force pilot physicians were instrumental in integrating that system into the F-16. It's about the F-22 pilots that suddenly started experiencing respiratory symptoms, uh, symptoms of hypoxia, uh, symptoms that would actually last even after they had landed. And we're talking about a fifth generation fighter that had just come into operational status and suddenly was grounded. And if it were it not for a pilot physician who had in fact just qualified as an F-22 pilot, who also happened to be a mentor of mine and is now a close friend, so that jet would not have gotten back into the air. He was responsible for running a lot of the research studies and doing the analysis, uh, in cockpit analyses that uh, helped pilots or helped the Air Force recognize what was going on. Uh, ultimately, it was an issue with the onboard oxygen generating system that takes bleed air from the turbines, concentrates it, and extracts oxygen for the cockpit. And they recognized that in order to uh, mitigate that risk of any contamination or any other shortcomings, they ended up integrating a supplemental oxygen system in the cockpit. And the jet is doing fine now, but it was pilot physicians that were, actually it was one particular pilot physician that was instrumental in, in leading a lot of these efforts. So, you know, back to my story real quick. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm 29. I've now joined the air commissioning in the Air Force as a second lieutenant. Uh, you can see my uh, wife pinning on my lieutenant bars and my young son there. Uh, usually when doctors join the Air Force, you come in with a little extra rank and a little extra pay. But if you want to be a pilot, you got to start at the bottom, just like everyone else. And so that's what I did. Went on to fly the T-37, uh, which is no longer in service. I was one of the last student classes to actually fly this aircraft. You can see from the cockpit, it's probably older than most of the systems you have in uh, your museum. Uh, but uh, it was a good trainer. That was for the first half of pilot training. And then you know, went on to fly the T-38. For those of you that have seen the movie Top Gun, you might recognize this as the enemy MiG-28. Uh, it's not a real aircraft in the movie, but uh, it's actually an Air Force T-38 trainer. Fast forward uh, two years later, you can see time flies. Uh, my son's now just about two years old. This is the night of graduating from pilot training. And from there, went on to fly the mighty B-52 affectionately known as the BUFF, B-U-F-F. So what does that stand for? Big, ugly, flying, let's just say fellow. And this aircraft designed in 1952, originally had one single mission. It was to deliver a nuclear strike into the heart of the Soviet Union. But it proved to be such a versatile aircraft that we kept upgrading the new models of it and putting on different engines. And we just added more weapons to it. All of you are familiar with, you know, you've heard the term uh, carpet bombing. Through Vietnam, we had a lot of gravity munitions added to it. Uh, when I joined the B-52 and started learning how to fly it, we were doing, obviously, the nuclear mission, understanding command and control procedures when the order comes from the president, how to start World War III. But we also did a direct attack. Uh, we did standoffs where you go to the border of a country and uh, kick down their enemy air defenses from a distance. We also do close air support uh, where we are supporting the ground troops and separating them from the enemy, even when they're being overrun by a matter of uh, hundreds of yards. And believe it or not, uh, well, I've also done maritime mining, supporting the Navy, dropping mines. And I've also even helped capture uh, cocaine. We've actually worked with the DEA and have done drug interdiction off of the uh, coast of Central America in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we have targeting pods under our wings that we normally use to scan for a target or shoot a laser to guide some laser guided munitions. But turns out, given how much fuel the B-52 has and our ability to loiter for six to 10 hours if necessary over the target area uh, with our scanning equipment, we are able to cover a lot of ground. And so we were able to catch this one drug boat that uh, started to uh, recognize that they were being tracked and we called in the DEA and they started throwing cocaine out the side of their boat. So like I said, it's a versatile aircraft and it's done a lot of things and it's going to continue to fly. Believe it or not, 
Right now, Congress has approved this to fly till 2060. It's going to be a 100-year-old aircraft, which, you know, I have mixed feelings about. While I'm affectionate for the aircraft, I am concerned about if that's really the smartest thing for, uh, you know, the services country having such an old aircraft flying, even if it can fly. But that's for a different uh, discussion. So what I'd like to talk about now uh, as I start to frame some of the examples that I have as a pilot position, I want to start with a quote from a man that I highly respect, John Boyd. Uh, John Boyd was a Korean War era fighter pilot. He actually was qualified as a fighter pilot at the end of the war, so he never really saw any combat. But I would submit he's committed, con contributed more to military aviation than any other human being. And I don't hesitate to say that. Uh, he actually quantified air combat maneuvering. And that is to say, before him, they thought being a fighter pilot was an art. It's not something you can teach. It's just something you have innately. Uh, what he showed was you can actually design aircraft and calculate its airspeed and its maneuvering capability. And, but in order to do that, in the 1960s, he had to steal $2.1 million worth of IBM mainframe time uh, at night from a, a base in Florida. But with his calculations, he revolutionized aircraft design. He was able to show exactly how fast and how maneuverable an, air, air, an aircraft could be at a certain speed or a certain altitude. And so all of the military aircraft design today all have these tables in, in the operating manual called energy maneuvering diagrams and tables. So uh, what else has he done? You may have heard of the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. It's become business strategy now. But that was him figuring out a better way to defeat your enemy designed the F-16. Uh, so it goes on and on. I could talk just about him all night. But it's important to know that despite all of his amazing talent and all of the things he accomplished at a young age, he was not well received by senior brass in the military. It said at his eulogy in 1997 when he passed away, his contributions to the Air Force were matched only by how many times the Air Force tried to court-martial him. And, and so with that, I'd like to share a quote uh, where he's mentoring a young pilot that's following up in his footsteps. And he says to him, Tiger, one day you're going to come to a fork in the road and you're going to have to make a decision about which direction you want to go. He raises his hand and points. If you go that way, you can be somebody. You will have to make compromises and you'll have to turn your back on your friends, but you'll be a member of the club and you will get promoted and you will get good assignments. Then he raises his hand, other hand in the other direction and he says, or you can go that way and you can do something, something for your country, for your Air Force and for yourself. If you decide you wanna do something, you may not get promoted I mean, you may not get good assignments and you certainly will not be a favorite of your superiors, but you won't have to compromise yourself. You will be true to your friends and to yourself and your work might make a difference. To be somebody or to do something, in life there's often a roll call. That's when you'll have to make a decision. To be or to do, which way will you go? You know, and I read that at a very difficult time in my career and it really crystallized how I felt about my service and I knew where my focus needed to be. And you know, the opportunity came soon enough when I was approached by a pilot who had been disqualified from flying for six years. He was told you could never fly again. And keep in mind, I'm just a co-pilot still, still pretty young. Uh, I'm keeping current as a doctor by volunteering in my free time at, uh, you know, at clinics and with the Red Cross. And, and so I'm keeping my clinical skills sharp, waiting for the opportunity to serve as a doctor in the Air Force, but I'm not doing that yet. And that's when I'm approached by the senior officer and my leadership is now petitioning the chief of staff of the Air Force, the four-star general, to return him to flight status, to overturn, overrule the military or the medical community's uh, ruling on his flight status. And so I looked at his records and uh, uh, asked to submit his, uh, my opinion. What I noticed was while there was a certain risk to having part of your retina detached and then repaired, 
which means it creates a small blind spot, tiniest blind spot. And as long as you have both your eyes open, he's seeing exactly what I see. And as long as it doesn't involve the fovea, which is a very hypersensitive area of the retina, uh, there isn't a significant loss of depth perception. But anyway, there was, it was assumed that if you have any kind of damage to your retina, you can never fly again. I simply put on my doctor hat and correlated his pathology with how we operate and employ the B-52. And let me just walk you through some pictures of what aerial refueling is like, and I'll continue the story. So this is what it's like from the B-52 cockpit to get gas from a tanker. This is in perfect weather during the day, pretty simple. Now, normally you start when the tanker's about three miles out, but uh, in this case, uh, you know, this, this picture starts when we're about one mile out. This is about a half mile out. Now we're about 75 feet, 25 feet, and we're just about to get into contact. And you can actually see those two rows, uh, those two black lines, and you see a red light on the side. That's actually how it tells us if we're too close, if we're too far back, or if we're too far up or too far down. And that's how we uh, stay in position. And this is the view from the tanker. And again, from the cockpit. The point of this is, this is pretty easy to do during, well, it's not easy to do. It's like balancing an elephant on a unicorn. But compared to doing this at night, uh, it, it's worlds apart. But the point is, I pointed out that to do aerial refueling, I'm not using true depth perception. I'm able to actually observe where the tanker is and use visual references, meaning how does that wing of that airplane line up with a bar on my window? I'm using other cues other than true depth perception, like parallax motion, relative motion, some other physiologic uh, uh, techniques. And then I'm also using instrumentation and radar to make sure that I can connect. If I had to rely on true depth perception, I would never be able to do this. So I explained at night, a tanker starts out as just what looks like a twinkling star. And if I can do aerial refueling at night in bad weather, uh, and I'm hardly using any depth perception, perhaps this pilot should be allowed to do aerial refueling. Then I looked at how do we do close air support? You might, uh, when you think of close air support, we're talking about how do we help ground troops when they're uh, up, uh, being overrun by the enemy or they're in close proximity to the enemy and they need uh, us to help them with extra munitions. Well, you might think a helicopter or an A-10 that just flies and the pilot looks out the window or aims his gun and figures out where to shoot. Well, we can do that same mission. But we don't, we're a B-52. We're not flying at that low altitude. We're actually at 20,000 feet. Ground controller is giving us coordinates, and I'm bombing on a lat law and delivering the weapons to serve them. And the other option is to actually use the pod, the targeting pod under my wing. I can send a video feed to the a ground controller, and he's going to say, yep, you know, look at that building on the bend of that river. Go about 100 yards to the east, and you see three trees behind a house. That's what I need you to strike right now. Cleared home. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but essentially that's what we do. And so again, a B-52 pilot can do that mission without having to use his eyes and true depth perception. And then finally, when you're talking about threats, surface to air threats, and any kind of modern surface to air missile, if it's launched against me, it doesn't matter how good my eyes are. I'm in a B-52. I'm not going to get away from it. Uh, so when you consider how we do our mission, and you correlate that with his pathology, I submitted that there was no risk. And so I ended up writing a paper and addressing it to the chief of staff of the Air Force, signed from the assistant flight commander and lowly co-pilot, who just happened to have a medical degree. And uh, lo and behold, this pilot was given his wings back. And you know that set in, uh, set in motion this idea for me, which was, you know, it's about serving the people beside me. That's what being a pilot physician is about. And fast forward, uh, you know, through my career, I started uh, working actually as a flight surgeon. And so now I was actually balancing my time in the clinic, as well as a test pilot responsible for testing new weapons, new tactics, new systems, uh, life support systems, laser eye protection, uh, you name it. We were doing all kinds of science experiments. And uh, some of these uh, tests, we actually had to do it at night, believe it or not, because we can't uh, allow for satellites to be overhead observing what we do. So, you know, I've done test missions in the middle of the night, going out to certain ranges and having all of our other assets monitoring how the test goes. Uh, so I always felt like 
as a test pilot, you're supporting the warfighter. You're no longer in a combat role, but you're responsible for understanding what the warriors need and designing systems that support what they do. But moreover, as a pilot physician, it was about making sure that the systems that we were using, the human wasn't being forced to adapt to the system. The systems should be designed to adapt to the user. And that was actually a new concept that I really pushed hard on. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that it took hold more so uh, after I left uh, during my time in the Air Force. And nowhere was that more evident to me in an experience that started back in July 18th, 2008. You know, off the coast of Guam, I'm a brand new lieutenant coming off of a first deployment, and we lost a B-52. And we lost the whole crew. And even the people that ejected didn't survive. And when they did the investigation, they told us the, uh, they just ejected too late. They were going too fast and too low when they lost control. And uh, the ejection seat did what it was supposed to, but uh, it was just too late. The fact of the matter is we had a 60-year-old design in our ejection seat. Granted, we have all these modern weapons and sensors and other avionics, uh, our ejection seat was terribly outdated. And for me, I never lost sight of, uh, you know, these people that I'd lost. And this was the first time I had experienced uh, a loss of friends uh, in the line of duty. I mean, it wasn't the last time, but it was certainly the first. Uh, in fact, the co-pilot was my student leader during pilot training. I had known him for almost two and a half years at this time, and we had gone through B2 training together. So, what I'm getting at is, you know, this inspired me to start thinking about the ejection seat. And in my research, what I discovered uh, was, hey, you know, there's a lot of pilots experiencing back pain. So that's how I got started, uh, doing some clinical research in that. And then it ultimately led to me asking the question, why don't we just put in better seats? We're improving so many other systems. Why not the ejection seat? And eventually, once I was in the test community, I was around the people that actually can answer that question. And when I asked that question, at first glance, my suggestion was literally left out of the room. When you look at all of the other combat capabilities we need to add to the B-52 uh, for the next 10 years, there's just no money to pile on the added cost of ejection seats, even if it is going to save lives. I wasn't willing to take no for an answer just yet, so I ended up going on my own little personal crusade to do more research. And so I started talking to engineers. I started talking to other organizations and agencies across the Air Force. I even talked to ejection seat manufacturers and Boeing executives. And, and through my research, I learned that, you know, we had one of the worst survival rates of any ejection seat. It's about a 60% survival rate across the board uh, or since the history of this aircraft. And through some of my clinical research, I learned that the uh, current 20% of today's pilots actually exceed the original design specifications for weight on this uh, ejection seat. And I also learned that a lot of the parts were on back order and the Air, uh, Air Force was actually looking to reverse engineer some of the components to build the blueprints for them so they could actually manufacture these themselves at enormous expense. And so I compiled enough of this data and what I saw was an opportunity here to show that if we just invested in new seats, we could actually lower the cost because we'd be sharing parts with all of the seats from other aircraft in the Air Force inventory, and we'd also save lives. And so that became my mantra, you know, save money, save lives with new ejection seats. And I pushed this case to anyone that would listen, uh, regardless of their rank. And the fact of the matter is I even got in trouble twice by some senior officers who said, hey, uh, you know, you're pulling people off of their regular job to do this. You know, meanwhile, I'm doing this on my lunch break and in my free time out of a sense of purpose. And my response was, well, sir, I didn't tell these people to do this. I just asked them about it and they were inspired to do it on their own. And, you know, this is sure I'm getting in trouble. But as John Lewis said recently, it's good trouble and we should all strive to get into good trouble. And as I was leaving the Air Force, one of the last things uh, in my last month in the service, what they told me was, you know, Dave, we've researched all of the work that you've done. And you know what? You're right. We can't continue to sustain this seat. 
uh, given what the lifespan is for this aircraft, we have to look at a solution to fix what you've, uh, what you've uh, researched. And so for me, I'm hoping one day someone's going to eject from the B-52 and they're going to come home to their family. And uh, you know, no one will remember that there was this mad major running around in the Air Force yelling about B-52 ejection seats for a long time. But uh, you know, I feel as though if that one life is saved, it's all worth it. You know, for me, or, or rather, you know, I think everyone joins the military for different reasons. But in the end, I would argue we're all in it to do one thing. And that's, and it's, it's especially important with pilot positions. You know, our job is to take care of the men and women that stand by us in defense of this country. Uh, and, and so that's what I felt was my proudest moment in the Air Force is with the B-52 ejection seats. You know, there's plenty of other stories I'm happy to share some other time. Completed uh, my commitment, which is a 12 and a half year commitment to the Air Force. And given the, some of the things that I had done, like the ejection seat, I felt like there was more opportunity for me. I felt like I was just getting started, even in my 40s. And so instead of going to be an airline pilot or going back into clinical practice, I ended up going to business school. So in 2017, I moved out to uh, Palo Alto from Louisiana. And this is actually my last flight in the B-52 and came out here. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's a whole other world and I'm getting started all over again. But like I said, you know, every year in the military, we do what we do to look out for those that serve beside us and honor those that have made the ultimate sacrifice and aren't with us anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, that's interesting. Um, I know that there are folks who are listening who probably have questions and by all means uh, type them in the chat box. I did have a, a question for you to just kind of get things rolling and that is, you know, like with the ejection seat, issue, and I'm sure there are many others, I would imagine that there are engineers at the contractor company who builds the aircraft who also might be aware of these things, but, but, they, but I'm assuming there is a, a fairly set process of policy making that has to go before a contractor even gets a hint that they should be working on something. Is that frozen stuck, or is there an actual process for, let's, let's try to fix these problems or is, is the process there and it just doesn't work well or what's the situation? Yes, to all of that. So <laughs> let me just start with the ejection seats. So the manufacturer for this is the Weber company and they no longer exist anymore. So that's why there's no records, there's no uh, blueprints, there's no designs for these parts. You can't get them anymore. And so we were putting things on back order and uh, just pulling them out of old jets. And so we don't, we didn't have enough parts. But what your the rest of your question is really getting to a whole nother issue. And that's comparing what we had in the 1960s, where a lot of technology, 80% of technology came out of the government and permeated into the private sector. Innovation happened in the government first. Now it's inverted. 80% of innovation happens in the private sector and the military is trying to find ways to bring that in. But the challenge is, like you alluded to, you used the word frozen. So I, I suspect you know, you're, you know quite a bit about uh, the Air Force or the military acquisitions uh, issue. There's what we call the frozen middle. There's a lot of people who've been doing this for a long time who are really used to having a certain process. And the incentives are such that it's easier to just keep doing what you're doing, sustain the existing systems, than to introduce chaos by bringing entirely new systems that throw things into disarray and require a lot more uh, thrash and, and coordination. And so I would argue it's a combination of a lack of awareness of some of these problems because a lot of the Air Force didn't even know some of the things that I shared with them because no one had consolidated all of it. The left hand sometimes doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Uh, and I was just able to draw those connections. But the other part is just the incentives. There's, you reap what you incentivize. And, uh, you know, the way contracts are and the, uh, the process for introducing new technology is so complex that very few private companies could even navigate these things. 
So mm. uh, I'll leave it at that. Interesting. Uh, we have a question from Rishi, an interesting one. Could you describe the current path to being a flight surgeon today? And what would you consider as the biggest challenge pursuing a dual career from a personal or professional perspective today? <clears throat> ah, I love that question. So, uh, so I just want to clarify, you're asking how to become a flight surgeon, not a pilot physician. Uh, so to be a flight surgeon is to uh, just go to medical school and uh, you can do your residency in whatever you want. And then you just need to train in the Air Force in aerospace medicine. But I'm going to also assume you're, uh, or presume you may have meant how to become a pilot physician. So the traditional course of action is for a pilot who comes straight out of college or the academy, you become a pilot, and then you stay within the Air Force and then go to pilot training after you've finished your commitment as a pilot, and you're staying within the system. And then if you're still medically qualified, you can see if you can get assigned back to your old airframe or another airframe. Uh, we do have a new system for flight surgeons. Since I joined the Air Force, they did open it up. If you're a flight surgeon and you're under 30, we can get, uh, we reserve one or two spots for people, for doctors to go straight to pilot training. Uh, but like I said, no one did what I've ever done and that wasn't an option. And so there was no way to do what I did other than to just pioneer a path that just didn't exist. And so that was the big challenge. So the last part of your question was, what's the hard, uh, what's the challenge of having a uh, essentially two careers. And it's the fact that people look at you as one or the other, and they're going to compare you. So, you know, some people might look at me and say, you're a part-time pilot or you're a part-time doctor. And I would argue, no, I'm neither. I'm a third entity altogether. I'm a pilot physician. By putting together these two perspectives, I see problems that other people don't see. And I'm able to solve problems that no one else can solve. But the challenge is when you go up against other doctors, uh, they may feel threatened by you. They may say, well, you're, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're a junior doctor or you're a lower ranking doctor, but you're a pilot. And in the Air Force, it's all about hierarchy and having very strict pathways of progression. And so you can see how someone who starts blurring the lines and crossing the streams, it doesn't always get received well. And the same thing happens on the pilot side. You know, uh, pilots may look at you and say, well, do you think you're better than me because you're a doctor? Uh, you know, you're just a captain or you're just a lieutenant. And so, yes, I faced a lot of resistance from people that didn't understand that. But, you know, if you look in this picture, uh, some of the, uh, you know, the commander right there, you know, and, uh, just standing to my left, I actually talked to him just yesterday. And I've been out for almost three and a half years. And he recognized that, look, I get it. You're different from all my other pilots. And I need you to work on things that only you can work on. So it's sometimes it's tough trying to compete. And I try not to compete against pilots and doctors. I try and say I'm something altogether unique. But the important ingredient is having bosses and having leaders that recognize your unique value. And I would argue for every one of you, regardless of whether you've done two different careers or not, you each have unique individual strengths. And I'll bet you you've all uh, struggled and been in places where people measured you the wrong way. You know, I'm reminded of this quote, if you judge a fish by how well it climbs a tree, it's going to think it's stupid its whole life. And so it's about finding where you, your, your unique strengths can come to bear on really meaningful problems that only you can solve. Interesting. Um, kind of following up on that, in terms of career path, what support does the U.S. Air Force provide for someone coming out of high school? And I'm assuming it's the path to Air Force ROTC. I'm not sure, but what, what are some of the, the directions that someone coming out of high school um, can take that lead to a career in the Air Force? <clears throat> well, there's a, a lot of different career paths. Uh, you can either go straight out of high school to college and do ROTC and get commissioned when you graduate and then go straight and then apply for a pilot slot. Or you can go to the Air Force Academy uh, that you need to do when you start as a junior in high school and then go on to get a, uh, you know, then you'll commission and have a career in the Air Force. The other option is OTS, Officer Training School. You actually can just go to any college, not do anything uh, with the military. And later on in life, you can just say, look, I want to join the Air Force. I have a college degree. And you can commission as an officer all the way up to age 35 if you don't want to be a pilot. 
Okay. So those are the three options that are out there. Speaking of the B-52 service, how many of them are still in the uh, country and how, how are they deployed and spread out all over there? Are they just in a cluster of bases or, or thinner than that? <laughs> uh, so I, I, I can speak, uh, you know, without divulging too much, uh, we have two bases, two B-52 bases, uh, North Dakota and Louisiana. And uh, we deploy all over the world. Uh, you know, when I first came out, we were deploying to Guam and we were doing the just the deterrence mission, the nuclear deterrence. We were flying all over the Pacific, doing a lot of saber rattling against uh, some of our adversaries, uh, China and Russia mainly, and working with our allies in, you know, with Japan, Thailand, and a lot of those other uh, South Asian uh, countries. But, uh, you know, in recent times, we've been deployed to Syria. Uh, obviously, Afghanistan and Iraq were a uh, mainstay for the B-52 for many years. But, uh, you know, right now, the Air Force is becoming more agile, and we are trying to forward deploy the B-52, be more mobile, uh, meaning can we forward locate it in, in more places? The challenge is a giant aircraft like this, we need a very long runway, and we're a very heavy aircraft, so we need certain uh, surfaces to be reinforced to a certain degree to even withstand the B-52 taxiing around when it's fully loaded. Oh, and the last question, uh, this is, uh, th there's roughly a little less than 80 B-52s in service right now. I'm guessing too, once a pilot goes through their fighter training and then they find that they have been assigned to the bomber track, some might see that as some sort of a dead end, but does that mean if you want to fly a B-52, it's easy to get into that track? <laughs> uh, so it depends. Uh, you can, you're right. So, you know, if, myself included. You know, I wanted to be a fighter pilot coming uh, into pilot training, but there's a different culture and a different uh, lifestyle, and there's a different characteristic for flying each aircraft. And sometimes, uh, you know, we joke around, don't worry, uh, you know, you, people may not pick the B-52, the B-52 is going to pick you. Uh, but I got to say, for me, this was the right aircraft for me. Uh, you know, in pilot training, you start the first half in T6s or T37s like I did, and then you track into fighters or bombers. Uh, I'm sorry, to the fighter bomber track, and then to the heavy maintenance track, or then there's a helicopter track as well. So, uh, you know, all the people that fly T38s go to fighters or bombers. And yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, came to the B-52 reluctantly, and there's a lot of people that this is what they wanted. You know, their father flew it, uh, and we even had one person, his grandfather flew the B-52 as well. But for me, as an older person with a family, this was the right lifestyle. I mean, I wanted to be on the front lines. I wanted to be in a combat role. I didn't want to be a support asset, which is why I didn't come in as a straight doctor. But at the same time, uh, you know, the, the fighters deploy a lot more. And there's a different culture that I, I think just wasn't suited for someone, you know, at my age. Um, you know, I was 32 years old going to pilot training with people that were 21, 22 years old. And, um, you know, you got to find the right fit for yourself personally. Um, looking at some of the questions here, I'm kind of uh, paraphrasing as well. Um, would you say that all the other sort of large aircraft assets in the Air Force have the same kinds of issues? You know, you fought a battle over the ejection seat. Is this, are there going to be the same kinds of battles against frozen, the frozen middle in the B-2 or other aircraft that are out there that are flying a similar mission? <clears throat> Simple answer, uh, yes. Uh, you know, it, it's not the aircraft that's the problem. You know, it, I have a philosophy. Everything's a people problem. You solve for that and all the other problems will solve themselves. And so I, I think it's a people problem and a process problem, getting people the right incentives to look at, uh, you know, make it worth their while to tackle the right problems. Uh, you know, I don't know what it was, but this squadron, when I came together in this squadron, it was just all of the right people came together and uh, we just were not willing to accept no, uh, you know, take no for an answer when we said, this is what the aircraft needs to be more effective in combat. And in fact, we were dubbed by senior leaders uh, of this particular squadron, my peers and I, as the peasant uprising. Because we, in a matter of three years, we fundamentally transformed the future of the B-52 across so many different criteria. I mean, we are going from a five-person jet to a four-person jet because we're going to introduce new systems, a new radar, 
and we're going to be able to create better crew coordination. But it was, you know, I, you know, I granted I tried to fight for deep two ejection seats, but I was part of this group that was also revolting against a lot of these other problems. So, uh, you know, to answer your question, you know, what I saw was, you know, the right people coming together at the right time. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you really stick to your principles and you're willing to put people's opinions of you aside. Well, we're going to follow up and finish up with one last question, Dave. And here's, here's the one that you get all the time, I'm sure. What's next for Dave Prakash and your career in the next five years? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after going to Stanford and studying business and stuck around to do a public policy degree as well, uh, I'm involved in AI technology and healthcare right now. So, you know, my goal right now is to transform care delivery and improve health outcomes through better technology. And uh, ironically, uh, you know, when you try new things, it's not as though the lessons I learned as a pilot and then the lessons I learned as a doctor and the lessons I learned trying to fight the system and, you know, forcing it to change, you know, those are all lessons that stick with me and that I'm bringing to bear in my job today. And, you know, I don't know where I'll be in five years, but I know what I'm doing right now is exactly where I need to be. And there's just more lessons to be had and more learning to do and to see what comes next. Well, we wish you the best of luck with that, Dave. Uh, and I would like to thank you for being our guest tonight. And for those of you who are uh, hanging in there with us, uh, by all means, show your appreciation for Dave with a, a, a hand clap or a thumbs up using the reaction button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, again, Dave Prakash, thank you very much for being our guest tonight on Hill or Hanger Talk. And uh, I'd like to thank again our sponsor, Provident Credit Union, and we're going to look forward to seeing everyone here again in two weeks as we host uh, Matt Croce and his talk on Cobras to Little Birds, Attack Aviation in the Marines, and Special Ops. So stay safe and have a great week, and thanks for coming, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone.